Joining me now to unpack uh, the day's uh, market activity, there is uh, Sean Dendere from uh, Tribe Investment South Africa. Sean, a pleasure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us. Okay, green screens all around. Not a bad uh, one to see uh, halfway through the last day of trade this week. Uh, let's talk about what is driving those positive sentiments. All right. Cool. So there are many different things driving uh, positive sentiment. So we've had a lot of news this week, starting across with um, in Europe. They're looking to cut interest rates in the coming month. Uh, this purely because if we're looking at the inflation, it's been quite tame for the past seven months. However, the month that they do decrease the interest rates, the they have to be quite careful because obviously if we're looking at the United States, um, uh, the FOMC, FOMC meeting earlier in the week stated that um, they're going to keep the interest rates the same, higher for longer. However, NFP coming up later today will give us a better view of what's going to happen with interest rates in the United States, which you know will give us a sense of direction for the rest of the global market. We must talk about uh, what the possible divergence between a Fed and an ECB interest rate decision might do to currencies, um, you know, and even to emerging market currencies. Sean, are we expecting uh, that if we do see, uh, you know, the uh, Fed holding and the ECB cutting, uh, and that isn't necessarily uh, congruent, that could result um, in other shocks? Yeah, definitely. I think the issue is that, you know, um, if the Fed holds and the ECB cuts, right, um, it depends on how aggressively the ECB does it. It will lead to the European economy being a bit shaky, for the lack of a better term, uh, due to that with the high interest rates in the United States, you'll see that there's going to be a lot of outflows um, from Europe into the United States, purely from uh, how much their money, how much money they can get back from the United States. And it also shows that, you know, maybe the euro as it stands, is, it is too strong and the euro will need to weaken a little bit for, you know, for that uh, economy to stabilize through that divergence. Interesting times ahead. Let's talk about Apple now. Uh, that's uh, one that I'm also keen to get your thoughts on here. We're hearing about uh, the biggest uh, share buyback program ever, uh, Sean. But I'm also keen just to then delve into these Apple numbers here that obviously uh, didn't meet market expectations. And what's also causing this? Because a, a bit of it is a China story. But from my perspective, it's also a bit of a, an innovation story uh, that could be lacking within Apple. All right. So I think, in my opinion, uh, the numbers went too bad and, uh, in relation to the size of the company. Right. So if we're looking at their revenue numbers, they did beat expectations slightly. However, what has been really affecting Apple uh, is the iPhone sales, right? And iPhone, iPads, MacBooks, etc. That has really decreased over time. And like you said, you know, there is an innovation issue. Because if we're looking at, you know, there was a supply issue in China with regards to their products and who's buying their products. And the world is also moving towards you know if we're looking at these big tech companies such as apple looking at things like ai i think where it, where ai is it's where money is being made or revenue is growing for you know a lot of the tech companies so i think apple really needs to maybe diversify a little bit further in terms of you know their product offering outside of you know the physical goods and you know investing a little bit more into you know where the world is going Will the share buyback keep Apple uh, as one of uh, the Magnificent Seven? I think so. I think a share buyback is really positive, especially for you know retail investors and investors at large, because this, Apple is showing confidence in their own company uh, by buying back their own shares, which definitely will drive positive sentiment towards you know investors to invest more into Apple themselves. Let's move on now and touch on what we might be seeing uh, with the possibility of Glencore making a bid for Anglos here. Uh, it does look like, uh, you know, the big boys are out with their big balance sheets, Sean. Uh, and of course, uh, we've got nothing concrete at this point. But this uh, does kind of add a bit of a, a co complexity to the conversation we've been having with uh, BHP and Anglos, which already was layered with complexity. 
No, 100%. Um, I think it is quite interesting. Um, if we're looking at BHP, you know, they're looking to consolidate or expand their, um, you know, their copper mining aspect of the business. And looking at, you know, their current CEO is really big into M&As, mergers and acquisitions, which has been, we can see a big change in BHP in the past couple of years in terms of how, you know, they're moving. So with Glencoe, you know, throwing a span in the works, it really, for me, looks like there will definitely be, um, I want to call it a war between who gets it. At the end of the day, I think, you know, looking at Anglo, they rejected $39 billion from BHP about a week or two weeks ago. So it's going to be interesting, interesting to see how it unfolds, interesting to see how, you know, the mining industry clearly is very interested in what Anglo has to offer to, you know, society and the world at large. And that's before we move away from this one, Sean. Is it possible that Glencore's also here uh, making a copper play? Uh, you know, we know, of course, that Anglo Stable has quite a few uh, goodies within it there. Uh, but we know BHP is really interested in copper. Could Glencore make use of the other assets, Kumba, uh, you know, thinking of Amplats as well? Uh, and that could actually be a better offer for Anglo's. Yeah, 100%. I think Glencoe is a little bit more diverse um, in terms of their product offering. And what Angler has to offer, I would assume that or well, think that Glencoe would pro probably, you know, come, come in with a much better offer. But we'll see how BHP responds, because from my understanding, they're actually looking to revise the $39 billion. Um, And obviously now that Glencoe is, um, well, it is rumored, they haven't really stated it outright um bhp might just come in with maybe even a much much bigger offer because they were interested from the get-go interesting times ahead indeed sean i'm keen to get your stock pick uh, but first i'd like us to reflect on counters that have found favor with your industry peers urban orders came out with their numbers and i get once again yeah they continue to sell their Wagovia at, I mean, the sales were double. Yes, they were slightly disappointed. The reason they're coming down, there's the issues with the FDA, the issues with, with the US who are feeling they're charging too much. And the reason is it's in the, what they call, I think in the pen or whatever they inject you with. I don't know yeah. what, what, what it's called. And they can't get enough of those and those are expensive. So there's pressure on them to raise to lower rates. And I think that's why you find both Eli Lilly and Nova Nordisk mm. share price. But the underlying sales just continues to grow. And this is a real drug with a real big, massive market, you know, and not, not, not as I said, the uh, celebrity market, you know, <laughs> for those celebrities who want to lose a few Ks or something, but rather for people yeah. who really need this yes. product. So, you know, um, yeah, I keep watching. Thinking data tech, um, it's an IT services and hardware company. Um, share price is probably about 50% undervalued. Uh, the shares come kind of 36, 37 Rand. We think it could easily be worth 70 Rand. And uh, it's on a five and a half PE, and Jens Montanana, the CEO, owns 10% of the company. So, in terms of sort of behavioral finance, the, the CEO is in the same boat as you. Mm. So, you know, I've always said, show me the incentive, I'll show you the behavior. Yes, is as keen to get the share price up as what we are. I'm going to go with Equinix. Um, it's an interesting company. I don't, know if it's a, I don't know if it's a buy or not, but I just think it's interesting because they're going to be reporting, you know, very, very soon. Um, the stock price has come off, to, you know, significantly, but we've got a price target of above $900 a share. We're kind of trading sub, sub 700. So there's about... It looks like it's about 30 30 percent dollar dollar based upside here one of the reasons that the stock has come off uh, you know one of the short selling firms hidden the hindenburg research has come out with a short sale on it so we've seen short interest building massively and they kind of saying there might be accounting funnies in here if had a look at it i don't think so but it's, it's all going to come down to to what they say in the results now i think they might address it because it has um has come off uh, if you don't know the company it's essentially a real estate investment trust a reit um that owns data centers it's uh, one of you know two large data since they're actually doing a big investment into Africa and South Africa, about 7 billion rand total. But they truly diversified multinational company uh, that uh, essentially manages data centers uh, mm. in, a, in, a, in a REIT format and, uh, and gives you, I suppose, access to, to a very exciting theme, which is, which is uh, AI and, and the growth. You know, instead of buying the chips or instead of buying the, you know, you know, the likes of OpenAI okay. through Microsoft, here you just buy essentially a data center banking on the fact uh, that you know we're going to see a lot more of uh, a lot more 
a lot more requirement. All right, let's talk about your stock pick today, Sean. Uh, which counter are you loving? So I'm not generally taking a counter, but what I'm looking at is the mining industry, uh, mainly gold producing stocks. The reason being is that this week there has been a massive pullback on the gold price. Um, that's purely because, you know, there has been the Middle East tension has eased a little bit. However, I do think there is still opportunity in the long run uh, due to the fact that, you know, in the Middle East, the war has not ended as much as, you know, it's eased. So there's still a lot of uncertainty there. And then if we go back, you know, to uh, something we were speaking about earlier between the Fed and the ECB, uh, that divergence there, there is also a lot of uncertainty in what, you know, the direction the Fed is going to take versus what the ECB, D ECB is going to do in the long run. So that is creating a lot of us uncertainty. And traditionally, as gold is being being a safe haven asset, uh, that could see the uh, gold price going back up, which will bode well for you know our gold mining companies. Brilliant, Sean. Thank you so much for your time there. It's a pleasure having you. That was your midday market update with Sean Dendera from Tribe Investment South Africa.